Okay, I think, um, I think the timing is about right. The last group was a little bit late, so it took us a few minutes to get settled. But um, it's 11.20 now, so I guess I'll get started. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Dan Paik. Um, I work for Samsung SDS. Um, I run the uh, development and um, you know, our software engineering teams over there working on our next generation cloud. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about today is really focused on high availability. So it's things like how do we get multiple availability zones working? Um, what can we do to build in disaster recovery in an OpenStack platform? Um, and a lot of that is, uh, the reasoning behind that is a lot of um, the background behind both the company Samsung SDS as well as uh, the, the enterprise customers that we have and sort of why, uh, that, why we have to build these things. So I wanted to discuss a little bit of background first in addition to some of the struggles that we have. And I think off the bat, you know, one of the major points I wanted to make was we don't really have a lot of answers. So one of our uh, big sort of points of coming here and talking to you today was to seek out assistance and help and, and let's have these discussions and let's sort of figure out some of these things together. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, so it's these things here. So Samsung SDS is a, you know, we're a fairly large company. We're a $10 billion company. Um, we've been around for about 40 years. We have 69 global offices, 23,000 employees, you know, and we have a few um, stats in terms of like most, most of our employees are in Korea. And for those of you wondering, it's South Korea. Uh, <laughs> we're in Seoul. Um, and, and that actually becomes a little bit relevant a little bit later on, but, um, and you know, we're 10th in terms of brands, 25 in terms of services. Uh, these are the types of things that we do. And the map there has the different offices that we have. Um, I actually work in Seoul, Korea, and it's, um, it's 3.20 in the morning over there right now, so I'm a little bit tired, but I think I'll manage okay. Um, so these are some of the awards that we've, we've uh, had more recently. We're listed in Gartner's Magic Quadrant, Data Center Outsourcing, Hybrid Infrastructure. Um, we're actually the first and only, as far as I know, we're still the only Korean company that's, that's in that quadrant. So a lot of the data center operations that we do, the data centers that we've built, uh, some of the things like PUE, those things are, uh, we're, we're relatively strong pioneers in that, at least in the Korean market. So uh, this is some of the certifications that we've done. Um, you know, those are the certifications that we have primarily from a security perspective. Um, most of our business as Samsung SCS, you know, a lot of you are probably aware of, of, of Samsung, the company. Um, you know, a lot of you probably have Samsung phones, laptops, refrigerators, TVs, that kind of thing. So the Samsung group itself is fairly large, um, of which there are many affiliate companies. Electronics is the largest one. And Samsung SDS, we're the um, IT services data center. We run a lot of the infrastructure for the entire Samsung group itself. Um, the majority of our revenue comes from internal Samsung group customers. And that's a lot of the cloud that we're trying to build is to manage uh, the different workloads that we have within the Samsung group. But we also, and we're trying to expand this, we also have non-Samsung business as well. So we also need to build a cloud that can support these types of different tenants, whether they're internal, whether they're external, whether it's sort of publicly facing, whether the internal private, all these different use cases are the things that we need to manage. Um, so the different types of industries that we, that we serve, um, a lot of what I talk about right now, electronics, semiconductor, that's largely because of the, the Samsung companies. Uh, Samsung Semiconductor is one of the world's leaders in that area as well. Um, batteries are with Samsung SDI, biopharmaceutical, biopharma Samsung Biologics, you know, apparel, you know, we even have clothing brands in Korea. Um, the financial services, you know, there's Samsung credit cards, Samsung securities, you can buy and sell stock, uh, you know, in Korea through Samsung. So, um, you know, it kind of hits every, every different area. Um, construction, engineering, there are theme parks in Korea run by Samsung. So, um, you know, apartment buildings, offices, that type of stuff. So, the, the industries that we serve are fairly broad. Uh, the services at the bottom are largely where a lot of our external non-Samsung business comes into place. So, public sector, government, you know, um, Samsung actually has hospitals, uh, colleges, as well as hotels, but the Department of Defense is also military uh, that we also look at as well. So we do have a wide variety of in industries, and our cloud needs to support these types of use cases as well as the different types of certifications that are required um, for these industries. Um, in terms of cloud itself, at Samsung, we've been working in cloud for a little over 10 years now. We started in the 2010s. Um, you know, the company has been in business for 40 years, but we've been working on cloud for the last 10, primarily with the aim to, the goal, to more efficiently run our hardware and, and services that we have. Um, I actually personally joined the company in 2019, and some of the things that we've done since 2019 is really we've built out additional data centers, so we went from six to 17, five domestic, 12 overseas. We have specific 
cloud pools set up for finance, uh, public sector, manufacturing R&D. We built a new HPC data center that just opened up uh, earlier this year. Things like water cooling and larger uh, racks that can handle more, more watts and more power. Uh, so that's a type of, uh, so our cloud itself has been uh, migrating very, has been moving a lot as well. Um, that's our global infrastructure. So um, when we talk about global infrastructure in this sense, you know, although we have the, the five in, in Korea, we, since we are a global company, we need to ensure that all of our workloads work globally as well as we have disaster recovery across the world as well. Um, we also need multiple availability zones for uptime. So all of the different areas that we, and the data centers that we serve need to somehow be organized in a way that they can work off of each other. And we need OpenStack to be able to support that as well. Um, and this is some of the expertise that we've had, you know, because PUE and um, green initiatives have been much more important in recent years. We've also focused on that as well, and we've gotten much better at that. So we're really leading a lot of the, we're really pioneering a lot of this, especially in the Korean market in terms of like, uh, don't just build data centers. Make sure that you're uh, using solar and wind and make sure that you're trying to be carbon neutral as much as possible. Um, and, um, you know, these are the different regions that we've set up so uh, across the world. So we have the Americas, you know, EU, Europe, AP, um, and we've set up different uh, data centers in these areas. And um, what we're talking about in terms of like disaster recovery is 2022 was securing main, most of these regions. This year, we're pairing these regions up in terms of disaster recovery zones. So for example, um, you know, Delhi is set up so that its disaster recovery is set up in HQ in, in, in Seoul, same with Singapore. Um, London has Frankfurt as a pair. Uh, San Jose, Dallas have, have New Jersey as a pair and Sao Paulo also goes all the way back to Korea. So you can kind of see that it's not necessarily optimal, but we'd like to add additional data centers so that we can pair up disaster recovery uh, better. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. Like, you know, in theory, if you wanted the uh, Singapore data center to back up to Delhi, you, you could. Um, you know, Samsung, we set up both a cloud as well as um, an MSP. So we're CSP and an MSP, and that kind of makes us unique in a lot of ways in that you know, my team builds this cloud and make, builds the infrastructure and builds the code for IS as well as managed services. But we also have a managed service uh, business that will actually go out and, and, and run these for you and configure this stuff for you as well for a lot of the customers that we have. So, um, but this is the way that we've recommended it to, to, our, to our customers and our, and our clients to say, here are the, the pairings that we want. 2024 is where we plan to set up multiple availability zones within these regions so that um, they, so that we can support uh, region, uh, zonal failures, right? So, um, you know, if a region were to fail, and this is where some of the um, talk that I had earlier about South Korea comes into place. You know, we don't live on a day-to-day -day basis in Korea thinking about our uh, unfriendly neighbors to the north, right? It's not really what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but from an IT perspective, we do think about that because in the same way that, you know, maybe in California, you might think about earthquakes or, or that type of thing. Um, in South Korea, we always do have a threat. So um, we don't know at some point when something might happen where either power gets shut down or systems get shut down or infrastructure gets shut down. So we always have to ensure that um, although we have headquarters there, we're backing things up into New Jersey. So there's an arrow that goes from HQ all the way to New Jersey. So if anything were to happen in South Korea, all of our systems are, are, would, are replicated in New Jersey for, for disaster recovery in that sense, right? Um, and then New Jersey can also be set up for, for Dallas as well as other regions as well. Right? Um, and you can think, you know, it's also costly to do this, but we can also think about systems such as the um, accounting systems that run all of Samsung, right? Those systems are global. They need to be up to date. And if those were to come offline, um, a lot of business would essentially be halted across the globe. Um, so, so it does end up being a pretty big deal in, in setting this up. Um, these are some of the customers that we have. Um, there's a good mix of a lot of Samsung companies as well as some of the non-Samsung business that we have as well. Um, the cloud platform itself that we built, you know, it's largely for enterprise. So the main goal for that is we're not really the type of cloud where, you know, we're not like a hyperscaler where anyone can just kind of come in, punch in the credit card, get some VMs, and, and start uploading the workloads. Like, we're really around like managed services for enterprise. So we have fewer customers, but the customers tend to be very large. Um, and with that comes a different set of expectations um, that are around HA and disaster recovery. Like, they tend to be less price sensitive, but they want to make sure that their workloads never die, right? Or, and, and, you know, sometimes it can be, you know, there's really, you know, in, in, in even in cloud and IT services, as much as we build in redundancy, there really isn't 
100% uptime, right? You know, we talk about five nines or three nines or, you know, six nines, things like that. Um, but a lot of our customers are like, you know, we want 100%. And a lot of times, some of my job is educating them around um, the complexity around that, as well as, you know, how do we sort of manage cost uh, and those things as well. So we do focus on enterprise market. Security is probably number one. Um, you know, the Samsung group is very sensitive when it comes to any type of, uh, you know, exposure to security. So, the, so we make sure that, you know, we are, you know, one of the most secure sort of cloud-based systems out there. Uh, if, we, if we, you know, need to add additional firewalls and if we need to be behind certain firewalls, we, we ensure to do that, um, even if it's additional cost. Um, and to the point where, you know, it does affect things like performance, things like scalability, th these things do come into play. Um, simple, we do have an, a, a CMP, a cloud management platform that we've built. Um, largely, it's used by our, our own internal staff because we are a managed service provider. But, you know, one of my goals is to sort of empower more of our enterprise customers to manage and run these things themselves. And smart is, well, we have a variety of ways that we can run our cloud, um, which I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, these are just the different services that we have. So, you know, in addition to standard IaaS, and that's where we are leveraging op the OpenStack platform, um, we have built a lot of managed services on top of that, right? So managed databases, you know, managed, um, you know, ML platforms, things like that. Um, now, to be honest, the current cloud that we've built here is not based on OpenStack. You know, we built this cloud in 2019 based on commercial software, commercial licensed software. Right? And, and one of the goals that I've had since coming into the company was we need to embrace a lot more open source technology. Like we cannot continue to uh, pay these licensing fees as well as being in closed source systems where we really don't have control over the new features that we need, right? And there is no real, well, there is no actual company out there that sells, here's commercial cloud in a box that you guys can use, right? It's all different. It, you know, there's virtualization software, there's, there's hyperscaler software. So bringing these things together in a way that we don't control the source code, and we have limitations to, to areas that we can um, that we can configure, the ways that we can build. Um, in my opinion, is not really the, the best way forward. So the initiative, one of the initiatives I've been leading is we need to we need to rebuild a lot of this stuff in open or in an open source based open source based platform using OpenStack, right? And that's really what brings me here today. To talk about a lot of this, right? Um, public sector, so. You know, we're really trying to branch and expand out into government. So this is local Korean government work. Um, so those are the different certifications that we need. So we need to build an OpenStack platform um, that complies with local Korean government as well as um, other governments around the world uh, that our data centers are located in. Finance, this is somewhat similar in that, like, you know, we actually separate our cloud pools for government and private public sector as well as the finance sector because there are different types of, you know, I guess what we would call here like PCI compliance and these types of things um, need, and there's some regulations around ensuring that physically the hardware is kept separated out. Um, personally, I don't like doing that, but it's kind of something that we have to do to have different pools of hardware and, and platforms set up. Um, and so for private dedicated cloud, like this is where a lot of our customers, one of the questions I get is, you know, why do they, why wouldn't one, an enterprise use the Samsung Cloud Platform as opposed to one of the major hyperscalers out there. And one of the, the reason I typically give is, you know, there are reasons why they cannot use a hyperscaler, right? Whether it's some security, whether they want some hyper, something on site. And so here, you know, we have configurations where customers provide space, power, and we'll just put in all the hardware for them, right? And we'll manage it remotely. Um, there are ways where we can disconnect it if they don't want that network connection where we can manage things remotely and we'll go on site to, to manage it for them, right? So, and we'll put people on site to do that, right? So some of the stuff, as you can see, doesn't necessarily scale to a, to a, to a, to a, uh, to a smaller enterprise. It would only really work for large enterprises and that's really what we, what we try to do. Um, so that's kind of what this was talking about here is, you know, there's a dedicated line where we'll manage it remotely um, on, the, on the side here, on the private cloud side, but the dedicated cloud is like, We'll just put everything, you know, we'll, we'll put all the operational hardware in. Um, we'll put everything into your data center, your site, so that you have your own cloud running. Um, and we'll even manage it for you on site. We'll have engineers there. We'll have support staff there, um, you know, sitting in your offices all day if you want us to do that. Um, so what do our customers need? What do our customers look to us when it comes to um, building high availability, right? So for our customers, 
really the most important thing is, is SLA. Like they want to make sure that things are up and running, that the workloads are up and running. You know, the Samsung Electronics teams, the semiconductor teams, all the different, the non-Samsung uh, enterprises that we work with, you know, they're really set about like, um, is our application going to stay up and running? Well, how you do that, that's sort of like the third point. They just trust us to do that, right? How you do that is really up to Samsung SDS. But what does that mean for us? It means for us, like, we need to support zonal failures, right? Like, if a zone were to go out because of a fire, and we did have a fire roughly 10 years ago, right, in one of our data centers. And, you know, physically we were, we had people, you know, manually, like, moving servers and trying to salvage servers as much as they can, and, you know, when that, when that data center did go on fire, right? So, um, so whether there's that, you know, Korea also had a major outage last summer. You know, it was for like, I think it was for one day because a data center, a non-Samsung data center did have a fire uh, that went on and it kind of took the entire country down, right? Because it was a major application that runs everything from chat to booking a taxi, right? To getting the, the uh, maps, uh, map, driving maps as well as like the metro maps, right? All of these things. So essentially the whole country had to live sort of without that for, for a day, and it really kind of crippled the entire, crippled the entire country, right? So, um, you know, although that wasn't one of our data centers, like, we need to make sure that these systems really, like, in a sense, never go down, right? So, for that, it means, you know, how do you set up things so that it can handle both a, a zone of fair so we can have high avail availability, as well as scaling, right? You know, if, if there's a lot of spike usage, how do we expand into the next uh, zone next to us, right? Our, our customers tend to be less price sensitive. I did say within reason because they still do, you know, try to push us on price and, and things like that. So it's not like, you know, they give us a blank check saying just do this. So it's not, the world isn't like, it's not, not that, that good, right? But like, um, but they do care a lot more about uptime and, and making sure that these things stay up than they do about, um, you know, saving a, a little bit of dollars here and there, right? So our customers really want this type of, of uh, high availability. Um, on the disaster recovery side, they really look for no data loss, right? Like, and, and no data loss is a really tough, tough sort of uh, thing to negotiate. And, and, you know, personally, I didn't really negotiate some of this stuff, and I probably would have phrased it a little bit differently. But a lot of our customers are like, we don't want any data to be, ever be lost in any situation, right? Whether it's, you know, whether it's threats, global threats, whether it's, you know, um, like physical threats, whether it's like, natural disasters, they just don't want any data loss, right? And they want recovery time within minutes, right? They don't want to be, uh, you know, they're not, they're not content with just saying, okay, we didn't lose any data, but it's going to take, you know, a day or, or a day or two to get up and running with your other systems. Like, you know, even in these types of disaster recoveries, they still want to be up and running within minutes off of a data center that's um, globally, right? Um, so we always have to make sure that these backup systems are ready to go. We have to test these systems. Um, you know, we, we run a lot of tests to make sure that, you know, we are running off of these other systems periodically. Um, and even things like, you know, that, that we wouldn't al always consider, things like, um, you know, if you have an in-memory database that takes a long time to load up into, into memory because the database is, you know, can be in the terabytes of size, then how do you make sure you have a backup of that in-memory in case it goes down while you're trying to put it in memory? So there's a lot of, like, different things that we always have to consider to, because they have to have that recovery time in minutes. Um, so this is from our customer's perspective. They're looking for this high availability. They're looking for disaster recovery. They're looking to always be up, right? Um, hopefully I made that part pretty clear at least. But from our perspective, right, as the guys running the cloud, what do we need, right? Well, we need, we need multi-tenancy, right? Like we need to be efficient because even though they're less price sensitive than maybe some other customers are, you know, they still are price sensitive. So we need to, you know, Profit, revenue minus cost, right? So we have to still drive down our costs as much as we can. So how do we get as much multi-tenancy as possible? How do we get, you know, you know, Samsung's internal workloads to work with their external facing workloads? You know, can we put them on the same set of hardware even though they're on different, you know, uh, network topologies, right? Can we put non-Samsung business onto the same servers as we have our Samsung business in, right? Like how do we ensure that, the, that these things are secure, right? Um, how do we put global, how do we, uh, how, how can we be more global? Um, and how do we sort of minimize these distinct cloud pools? How do we make sure that our hardware can be standardized? Um, how do we minimize any type of snowflake type of technology, uh, snowflakes that we put into here, right? So from the cloud provider business, we're always looking for, for these types of things, right? So we've taken all this consideration to try to build an architecture um, that we think might work. But some of the architecture challenges that we had, I'm primarily talking about 
three major areas. Like one is around identity, Keystone. How do you manage logins and, and, and people's identity and, and access management across this type of global infrastructure that I talked about? Um, you know, that, that's always one sort of area. What do we do with the control plane, the OpenStack control plane? Like, you know, how can we sort of run the control plane across, you know, these different global areas like that? You know, things like Ceph, OVS, like, there's always performance constraints in terms of like, not only management, but also, um, you know, how do you ensure that, that, it, that, that it's fast, right? Like if you're, if you're running off of a data source that's, that's far away, but your, you know, your actual workloads are running here, might be easier to manage in certain ways, but like, you know, your performance will probably be pretty bad, right? So the customers won't be happy about that either, right? So those are the things that we, and we've talked about, you know, we've explored a few options here, right? Like the first option that we kind of looked at was, Let's say all of our data centers is one huge cloud, right? And this is like west region, east region. These are like different zones within the regions. But if you thought about this globally, right? Like you can be in Korea, you can be in Europe, you can be in the Americas. Like if you think about everything as sort of one big cloud, right? Then, well, you know, we, that's the way this isn't stretched, right? Now, this is like, you know, there are pros and cons to this, right? Like, like some of the pros are like, well, it's easier to manage, you know, like we don't really have to talk about syncing data and things like that. But at the same time, like the performance will probably not be all that good, right? Um, there's some overhead here. Um, you also have some security concerns, right? Like let's say for whatever reason, you know, the, there's a security breach into your identity API, right? Into your Keystone, right? So now all of a sudden this breach is a global breach, right? So your blast radius is huge now, right? So um, any type of like those types of concerns are kind of what some of the downsides are in here. But on the plus side, like, hey, we can sort of manage everything in one place and, and, and it's relatively easy to do. And we think this sort of stretch way has some of those merits, right? Um, but if we look sort of on the other side of things, well, we also said, well, why don't we just set up one data center is one cloud is one region, right? So here we get rid of the concept of like, availability zones, like instead of zones and regions and stuff, everything's just a region, right? We just have a bunch of regions throughout the world, right? Um, now, if we do this, like, it's relatively easy to set up, actually. Um, the hard part is keeping things in sync. Like, that's a hard part, right? Like, you know, you'd have to build some type of layer on top of the identity API where it's like, okay, this is so that you don't access the identity API directly across these different regions. Like, you'd access it in one sort of like, portal, and then that portal would sort of manage it and keep these things in sync. Um, and that way, if, if, you know, from a security perspective, well, if your portal gets hacked, you're, you're kind of screwed. But at least if they hack one of these regions here, then you're, you've limited uh, that blast radius to here, right? So, um, you know, and, and performance-wise, it's actually pretty good, right? Because, like, you're, 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 um, you're, within, you're within your own region right there, right? But, like, scalability, it's a little bit suspect too, right? Because, like, you know, let's say West A region, um, is really popular and you need, to, you need to scale up over there and we're running out of, you know, compute or running out of block, but then, you know, it'd be really nice to just, like, add things into B and hook them together, but, like, some of that might not be so easy to do in this kind of situation, right? So um, there's definitely some pros and cons with that. Um, there's kind of a third approach, which is kind of a bit of multiple concepts. It's sort of a hybrid type of approach where, you know, the things that are kind of hard to do like identity and keeping these things in sync. And like if your identity API in, in the other picture got out of sync in some way, like it'd probably be pretty hard to troubleshoot that and get those things back in sync again. So like for some things like that, like let's try to like stretch that out and, and manage that in sort of one area like that. But for other things like the compute API, let's, let's do that. And let's have this concept where, you know, West A, B, C are all zones and they can sort of stretch across each other so that if you know, if zone A starts getting full, we can start to add things from zone B. And physically, you know, this is the same campus, right? So that region should be the same area. So it's like one building over. So like uh, you wouldn't have a huge performance hit in theory. So, you know, let's, let's try to look at this type of concept, right? So um, what we're doing at Samsung SCS is we're sort of pursuing that third option, right? Like how do we sort of pick sort of best of both worlds here of like management and ease of management yet still managing security as well as performance, right? So, but you know, like it's still in progress. You know, we'll probably make some changes to that architecture diagram that I showed you right now. Um, you know, I mean, I said if we encounter some unforeseen complexity, but like I think we probably will for, uh, come across some more stuff. You know, like how do we keep 
like in this picture that we had here, if we have multiple, you know, stuff storage across regions, but then they need to be kept in sync, like, you know, like we need to look at how we, we do that. We have to build lifecycle management tools to like say, well, how do we um, continually upgrade and manage this platform and environment you know, we have to, we're looking at building our own set of lifecycle management tools to support this architecture. But, you know, um, but I'm always open to finding other open source tools or things like that if we, if we can. Um, you know, how to set up a geo distributed database if it's if it's a global keystone the way that we talked about in there, um, in that other picture. How do we set up a geo distributed database for that? So those are the different types of like challenges that we have right now that we're trying to figure out and that we're trying to answer. Um, now, from a disaster recovery perspective, um, you know, these were the different sort of pairs that we had set up earlier. I think there's a, oh, I guess that. So, um, oh yeah, this one looks like it. Yeah, so there's a set of pairs um, in terms of like where the main data center is and where the disaster recovery center is. And this is how we set up, the formatting is kind of weird on this, but this is how we set up the way that we replicate uh, storage and database here, right? So uh, if it's a VM or data snapshot, we just use auto image replication for file storage. It's at the volume level objects. We, we use bucket level replication. For block storage at the VM and the bare, me and bare metal side, we use volume level replication for that. For the databases, depending on what the database is, um, for Postgres and, and EPOS and MySQL, you know, we, we use DB replicas. For some of the ones on the bottom, um, it's more of an object storage based sync that, that we've done for that. So this is how we've set up disaster recovery to ensure that the data itself is, my, is, is replicated with you know, as, as little sort of downtime uh, data loss as possible. But there's work on top of this, right? This is the data side. The second side is also making sure that things fail over, that um, the applications themselves are also updated on a regular basis um, as well. So um, those are the main sort of areas that we've been struggling with and that we're talking about. So for next steps here, you know, if some of the stuff that I was talking about today, like it's kind of an overview of some of the things that we're struggling with and that we're trying to work with at uh, Samsung SDS around, um, you know, multiple availability zones, disaster recovery, and how to architect these types of systems. And it kind of falls under some of the large sale SIG stuff. So, um, I mean, in addition to some of this, you know, there's also discussion in the large sales scale SIG about, you know, how do you scale up? And what are some of the bottlenecks and identifying those bottlenecks, right? Like things like RabbitMQ, right? How do you split that up? And we're talking, we have different RabbitMQs for different areas. Like even within compute, you know, we split that up into like the RPC RabbitMQ. So we've done some work there to, to uh, ensure that these things scale as well. Um, as well as the database side, like sharding databases. So those are the different types of topics, you know, things like you know, cells versus regions and, you know, wh what's going on in different areas. Like, those are the types of discussions that we also have um, in that special interest group in addition to, like, areas li like, like this as well. So, you know, we're really talking about, like, how do you work with OpenStack um, essentially to build not just, like, a private cloud for um, one company or one vertical, but something that can be used across multiple verticals the way that we're trying to do it as well as across global data centers, right? That's a type of work that, that we're largely involved in. So, um, you know, our headquarters in Korea, we're on Korea time, but always happy to discuss these kind of topics with, with anyone who also has this type of interest. You know, one of the things that I've sort of figured out in this, you know, path, I don't know, I just don't like using the word journey, but in this path is, um, you know, there really isn't a right answer out there in terms of like, here's a standard sort of given way that you guys need to do this. Here's an accepted way to do this. So, um, you know, we've been exploring a lot in our way, and this is sort of how far we've gotten so far. Um, yeah, so this is my contact info. You can always email me or chat. You know, I'll be here, here as well. Uh, and other than that, and thanks. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them as well. I think we have a couple of minutes uh, to do that. Hopefully you found this somewhat interesting. Thanks. And if there's nothing, you're all dismissed. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>